This morning, I've been thinking a lot about The Howling Man. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, The Howling Man is an episode of the original Twilight Zone. And in The Howling Man, a traveler, an American who is traveling through Europe, um, is in need of shelter. There's a big storm pouring down outside and he has nowhere to go. So he knocks on the door of this big old house outside of this little European town. And it turns out that the house is the home of this really old-fashioned, kind of eccentric religious order, uh, where the, the the brothers, the monks, they all have like long Old Testament beards, and they carry shepherd's staffs, and they're like religious zealots. And they reluctantly allow this weary traveler to stay with them for the night, because he has nowhere else to go. And while he's there, he hears this man howling, like in anguish, like in... in in sadness, in desperation. And he goes up to the door of the room where this man is kept. And it's this disheveled, uh, filthy, very thin, emaciated man. He looks just, you know, so just abused and worn down and hollowed out. And he's, and he's, he's desperate for help. And he, he is inside this room and the room is barred shut, right? He can't get out. And, and he tells the traveler he's been, trapped in there for years and the brothers of this religious order these these are fanatics and they they've got some strange ideas in their heads about him and they've kept him in here as a prisoner for all these years and they say they'll never let him out and please please you have to let me out I'll die in here if you don't let me out and the traveler goes to the head of the religious order and he says hey what's the deal with the guy who you have, you know, starving to death in that room over there. And the head of the religious order says, oh, you don't go near that door. Don't touch that door. And for God's sake, whatever you do, don't ever open that door because the man inside is the devil himself. And if you open that door and let him out, he will unleash his evil on all the world. And and who knows if we'll ever be able to capture him again. It was, it was you know, quite a bit of work getting him in there in the first place. And if he ever gets out, who knows what's going to happen. But the traveler is like, he finds this hard to believe. This man in the room, he's so weak. He's so helpless. He, he He's just pleading for help. This man couldn't hurt anyone. This man couldn't possibly be a danger to anyone. And the devil, like, what are, do they, do they seriously expect people to believe they have the actual devil in this room? So eventually the man, the traveler, decides to allow his compassion and his pity for this poor prisoner to overtake him. And he opens the door and the man in the room steps out. And immediately it becomes apparent that he is, in fact, the devil. And despite how weak and helpless and harmless he seemed while he was trapped in that room, now that he is free... He has regained all of his powers, and he is going to go out into the world and wreak havoc, just as he has always wanted to. The devil has been loosed. So what made me think of that this morning? Well, I'll tell you. I was scrolling through Twitter, as I often do, and I saw a tweet by uh, Kyle Griffin, who is a producer for MSNBC, and Kyle Griffin tweeted, eight State House Republicans in Iowa have introduced a joint resolution to amend the state's constitution to ban same-sex marriage. And Kyle Griffin's tweet was retweeted by Joyce Aline, who is a former uh, U.S. attorney from the Obama administration, and she adds her two cents to it, which is, this law, if passed, sets up a legal challenge to go to SCOTUS giving them the opportunity to reverse Obergefell and marriage equality. It's a real threat after the end of legal abortion. If Dems lose the White House in 2024 and the ability to appoint the next justices, more rights fall. So how does that remind me of the Howling Man? Well, remember about, oh God, how long has it been now? Ten years? When... The Supreme Court struck down the pre-clearance clause of the Voting Rights Act, and in the majority opinion, Chief Justice Roberts, as one of his justifications for striking down pre-clearance, he said, well, this, this law 
was written in a different time. Back when, when the Voting Rights Act was originally conceived and, and constructed and enacted, you know, racism and white supremacy and, and all of these, these uh, policies and, and attitudes that, that led to those policies, it was, it was a very different time. And America has, has grown and moved forward since then. So it doesn't make sense for modern day American election laws to be governed and, and limited by standards that were created back you know, 50 years ago when racism was, was a much greater problem than it is now. We just, we, we don't have the same, we don't have the same need for, for pre-clearance as we did back then. So it's, you know, we, we, we're going to strike this down and we need to come up with something else that's more fitting for, for our modern times. It's no longer necessary. That was letting the devil out of the room. The, the, the idea was, well, Things have gotten better. We don't need these laws. We don't need preclearance anymore because things have gotten better. And what happened within a few weeks of preclearance being struck down? Republican controlled state legislatures across the country were proposing amendments to their state voting laws that they would never have been able to get away with had preclearance still be still been in effect. They immediately began to pull things back to where they had been during the time when the Voting Rights Act was passed. Because it turns out, no, actually, in that way, America hasn't really evolved. We have evolved in, in many ways, mostly for the good, but in terms of racism, in terms of white supremacy, in terms of racist people, wanting to gain political power and use that political power to limit the political power and oppress and silence marginalized people, people of color, etc., and, 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 and limit their rights and in many cases just flat out rob their rights from them. No, that hasn't changed. And the only reason it seemed like it was better was because we had locked the devil in that room. And as soon as we let the devil out, the devil goes back to doing what the devil does. And now we live in that world. Last year, when Roe was struck down, people from all across the progressive side of the spectrum, from liberals to far leftists and people on every point in between, they all said the same thing. This isn't the end of it. Losing the right to obtain an abortion is not the end of it. They're coming for everything that we have gained. And in fact, Clarence Thomas even said in his opinion, in that decision, this opens the door to re-examine same-sex marriage. And now here we are. And yes, it's only a few Republicans in Iowa, but as, as the, the tweet said, this is part of a strategy to get this in front of the Supreme Court so that the right-leaning Supreme Court can now overturn Obergefell and strike down same-sex marriage, and, and, and it will no longer be a, a right for people nationwide. That's the strategy. That's what happens when you let the devil out. So many of us, too many of us, have, have gotten comfortable, have gotten to the point where we feel like we don't really need to guard the door of that room anymore. The devil's locked away. We don't need to worry about it. These battles are over, right? Same-sex marriage is the law of the land. We don't need to fight that battle anymore. But we do. That battle's never over. We know that the battle for abortion rights was never over. The right made that very clear. They never stopped fighting that tooth and nail, and yet for some reason we still let them win. Because we convinced ourselves, or enough of us convinced ourselves, well, that's never going to happen. We're not, they're not ever actually going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Like, that's, that's settled law. We, we don't have to worry about that. They're just making noise. I bet they don't even really want to, right? Remember that argument? Oh, no, they're right. They're never, they're never actually going to overturn Roe because they can use the, the, the prospect of overturning it to fundraise, and that's what they really care about. They're not really ever going to actually overturn it. Don't worry. There's nothing to worry about. The things we say to ourselves to convince ourselves that it's okay not to fight, 
that it's okay not to worry about it. That that that's in the past. It's not it's not our responsibility to try and do anything. These people aren't. I mean, yeah, they talk a big game, but they're all bark and no bite. They're not really a threat. Now Roe v. Wade is gone, and now they are putting pieces in place to get rid of same-sex marriage as well. They're coming for same-sex marriage. They had been coming for abortion for 50 years, and we know that they're coming for trans people, especially trans kids. They've been very clear about that. They've made no bones about that. Every single civil rights battle that has ever been fought that liberals, progressives, leftists, whatever you want to call them, whatever point on the spectrum you want to point at and say, I'm one of those. All of those battles that have been won or at least have been waged and we have seen some forward movement, some gain of territory, all of that is being threatened. All of it. Because we let the devil out of that room. That's what happens. These battles are never over. You can't defeat the forces that want to rob people of color of their voting rights. You can't defeat the forces who want to make it illegal for same-sex couples to marry legally and, and, and have benefits and, and have all of the same uh, positions and, and advantages in society as, as heterosexual couples do. You can't defeat that. You can't, you can't eradicate that. You can't eradicate the people who want to, frankly, eradicate trans people. You can't, you can't defeat that permanently. All you can do is lock it up. All you can do is contain it because those forces, those people, those goals that they want to achieve are rooted in the darkest impulses of humanity. They're rooted in ignorance and fear and prejudice and hate, things that can potentially exist in all of us. Things that are just part of human nature. They are not all of human nature, but they are part of human nature. And we will never be rid of them. And if we ever, for a second, forget that they're there or forget that there's something we need to be aware of and worry about, things like this are what happen. The devil gets out of the room and is free to wreak havoc. And I just hope that if we are able to get our shit together this time and push back against all of these attempts to rob people of their human rights, human rights in many cases, which we had had to fight to get them in the first place. If we ever are able to get the devil back in that room and lock him away again, I hope that it's at least another 50 or 60 years before we get lazy and we get a little too comfortable and we get a little too relaxed and we look at that pathetic, sad little man in the room and we start to think, well, he can't possibly hurt anybody. It's wrong to coop him up like that. It's wrong to keep him prisoner. We, we should really let him out because, I mean, look at him. He's so pathetic. Who could he possibly hurt? I hope we at least get a, a, a few good, solid decades of progress before we forget what happens when you let the devil out. <laughs>